Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Mary Grant, and I'm the president of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. And it is indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening, and thank you for coming for this remarkable discussion with a remarkable leader that we will have. Tonight, we're honored to hear from Secretary John Kerry as he shares poignant memories and lessons learned from his distinguished career while providing insights into our nation and our global issues. The discussion will be moderated by award-winning journalist David Bernstein. David, thank you for being with us. Um, last year at the Kennedy Institute, we had the privilege to recognize Secretary Kerry for a lifetime of distinguished and inspiring public service in his uniform as well as on beginning Capitol Hills and his unwavering commitment to those in this country and those overseas. Senator Kennedy and Secretary Kerry worked together with a passion and a shared commitment to strengthen the Commonwealth and the country, to improve the lives of all whom they served and represented, and to ensure that the United States was a partner and a leader to be called upon and counted on. As noted in his new memoir, the two maintained a deep friendship through campaigns to cloakroom camaraderie and legislative alliances. Secretary Kerry, in 2008, you delivered the commencement address at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, where I was president at the time. You encouraged those students that when it's right, fight to keep it right. When it's wrong, make it right. And you charged them with making a difference in their democracy. That's what we do every day at the Institute. We work to make a difference in our democracy. The Institute, as envisioned by Senator Kennedy, is dedicated to educating the public about the important role of the United States Senate, encouraging civic participation, and invigorating civil discourse. We are delighted to have two individuals in the chamber tonight that were part of the Institute's earliest days and remain connected today. Senator Paul Kirk, former state director for Senator Kennedy, and Barbara Soliotis. Thank you both for being here with us this evening. The work, the work that we do empower the next generation of leaders and inspires civic engagement. Democracy depends on participation and engagement. Through our exhibits, our interactive programs, and public programs like this evening, we do all that. Democracy is, is, a, is an action sport, and it's an essential that we all play a role in that democracy. And I now have the opportunity to introduce someone who is a remarkable woman and plays an essential role in this place every day. She is a tireless leader and a passionate champion for the Institute, Vicki Kennedy. Vicki co-founded the Institute with Senator Kennedy and serves as the president of the board of directors. In addition to her integral role in realizing the vision and the promise of the Institute, she is a leading voice in the country for the need for bipartisanship, for the need for civic engagement, and for the need for us to continue to work together. In my 10 months as president of the Institute, Vicki, I cannot thank you enough for your leadership, your support, and your friendship. Vicki Kennedy. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary, so much for those warm words. Thank you so much for your leadership of this institute. Uh, we have made such wonderful progress in this past year under your leadership, and I am forever grateful. Paul, Gail, Kirk, it's so wonderful to be with you. Barbara Suliotis, it's always wonderful to be here with you. It's great to see so many friends, Steve Rothstein from the JFK Library, all of our friends from the library who are here as well. It's great to be here with so many wonderful, dear friends. Welcome to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. I had to say that because I love saying that so much. Welcome to this very special program in our Getting to the Point series. As we gather this evening in this replica of the United States Senate chamber, I'm reminded of what my husband told me when he wanted what he wanted this place to be. He wanted it to be a place that inspires new generations to want to give back and serve our nation. He hoped that by walking through those doors, new generations would remember the men and women who had walked through the doors of the United States Senate chamber in Washington, DC. He wanted them to remember those men and women who had come together to address the great challenges facing our nation. And he hoped that by remembering those public servants who had made such an extraordinary difference that we would all be inspired to give back 
and make a difference as well. We are so honored tonight to have with us an inspirational public servant, a man who served this Commonwealth with great distinction for three decades in the actual United States Senate, after serving as our Lieutenant Governor and before serving as our nation's Secretary of State. He's been his party's nominee for President of the United States. And before all that, he served with honor and valor and profound heroism when he wore the uniform of this nation in combat. Indeed, John Kerry has given back in service to this nation for all of his adult life. And now he's written a beautiful, insightful, and moving memoir. We are so fortunate to hear from John this evening and to have the award-winning journalist and political analyst David Bernstein moderate the discussion tonight. Thank you so much, David, for being here. I've heard John say that he made his first foray into politics when he volunteered as an 18-year-old on the first Senate campaign of a young Edward M. Kennedy. Who would have thought at that time that he and Teddy would serve in the same body together for nearly 25 years. During the presidential campaign of 2004, I had the great privilege of traveling around the country and witnessing firsthand the sheer joy of the Ted and John show. I saw two men who were much more than colleagues. They were dear and close friends. They shared a bond an unbreakable bond of friendship forged by love and respect. As everyone in this room knows, our speaker earned a silver star and a bronze star with valor, as well as three purple hearts for his combat service in Vietnam. I'll never forget my husband's poignant description of the impact this, this, our speaker had and made on him in 1971 when he went to D.C. to speak out against a war he had come to see as a mistake. Teddy painted a picture, a vivid picture, as he described that meeting. I recall it well, Teddy said, standing there, tall, thin and handsome, with full dark hair. And then my husband paused for a moment and said, that was me. I don't remember what John looked like. <laughs> I don't know who laughed harder at that joke, Teddy or John. But then Teddy got serious, describing with undisguised pride John's qualities as a leader and a man of courage and conviction. Those qualities of courage and conviction were on full display when our speaker served as our 68th Secretary of State. From the Paris Accord on climate change to the Iran nuclear deal, John was not afraid to tackle the big issues or take big risks. Perhaps the best way I can introduce John Kerry tonight is in Ted Kennedy's own words. I have known John as a soldier, as a peacemaker, as senator, and as a friend. He understands that America's strength comes from the power of our ideas. He knows that a true leader inspires hope and vanquishes fear. He is someone committed to healed, to build, to hope, and to dream again. It is my great pleasure to welcome him now, my dear and trusted friend, the Honorable John Kerry. And please also welcome our moderator, David Bernstein. Vicki, thank you. Can I take a moment, David? Please do. I, just want, I really want to thank Vicki. I want to thank all of you for, for coming out and uh, buying so many of my books. <laughs> but I really want to thank you all for being here. I'm honored that Paul Kirk is here, Gail. Paul, thank you for your great service to the Commonwealth and 
to our national politics. You've been fabulous. And Barbara Siliotis, Barbara was the right arm, right brain, right uh, person to, uh, she really was sort of a senator in her own right. Uh, you know, Nick Littlefield was referred to as the 101st senator, he was the 102nd senator. We had both of them, by the way. So Barbara, uh, great to be with you, thank you. And Vicky brings back memories of uh, 1962 when I, was, I really was just this uh, kid right in high school and I volunteered and did anything and everything to learn. And I remember all the players back then, Eddie Martin, many of you may remember, and, and uh, Ed Moss, who we lost in the, in the airplane accident, and Terry Haddad, who's still around doing things. And, uh, and then there was the second floor where the power was with Steve Smith and Albie Cullen, a bunch of people. Uh, it was a lot of fun, folks. Eddie McCormick, Ted Kennedy, doing battle on Tremont Street with their headquarters, just one door apart, spying on each other and everything else. Uh, a lot of fun. And Teddy, God, we... Uh, boy, we could use Teddy's voice right now, could we not? I mean, let me just tell you. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, I, I'm privileged to be here, and David, thank you for taking time to be with us, and I'll go wherever you want to. <laughs> well, th thank you very much. It's an impressive CV, you know, that they listed. They left out, did not mention um, your foray into chocolate chip cookie uh, yeah, no, I was a, enterprise. I was building an empire, yeah. folks. <laughs> it's Family a whole marketplace. <laughs> I swear to God, I, I went down there with a, a friend and looked at this vacant spot after we came out of a restaurant in, in, in Family Law Marketplace. And um, we, we were uh, suffering from a bottle of wine, too many probably. And, and we both had a craving for chocolate chip cookies. And I looked over at this vacant spot in Family Hall Marketplace. And I, I said, you know, we ought to put a cocky, we ought to put a place in there and cook, make cookies. A week later, I, I've had I, I brilliant had a deal. ideas like that in Faneuil Hall late at night. Too, a week but. later, I had a deal with the Rouse Company. I had to figure out what I was going to make it. They said, "Well, we really want a gourmet shop here, not a fast food shop." And I said, "That's what I want: gourmet cookies, gourmet shop." <laughs> so we got in there, and uh, one week before we opened, I realized, "Man, I got to make some cookies. I need a <laughs> recipe." So I went home and I learned the chemistry of food in about four days, because the more you put things together, the more complicated it gets to cook. So I was, everybody thought I was crazy, but I was throwing away these cookies, making it. Ladies and gentlemen, within one year, we won the best of Boston for our cookies and our macaroons. Anyway, and the store is still there. And, and I had this vision of, of, of actually creating a franchise and everything else, and then I was so bored practicing law and yearning to be in public life to make a difference that I gave up that empire and became Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, a real powerhouse. <laughs> anyway. You could have sold cookies out of the state house. You know, yeah. that could have been a business. I'm still a cookie uh, monster, actually. Uh, I, I heard you're addicted also to uh, uh, fribbles. To, uh, yeah, fribbles. Yeah. That was one of my mainstays campaigning yeah. through the state. We always looked for friendlies. Yeah. We found a friendly and I had a fribble. Coffee fribble. So, so yeah. I. Um, so now you know the really important stuff. I know. We, we, we started off with the heavy, heavy material. Heavy duty. <laughs> um, so, since we're in the uh, uh, Senate chamber, um, I wanted to ask you uh, your feeling about how the, the Senate has progressed. I know you became, and you talked about it a good bit in the book, and it was fairly obvious from the outside that, that you were frustrated with the Senate by the end, with how it was operating. I imagine that you think that that's only progressed in the wrong direction under the, uh, the leadership of the, uh, of the Republican majority leader uh, the last few years. Do you, are, are you worried that these are irreversible changes or are, are you hopeful that, that things can turn back? Well, nothing's irreversible in America. I believe that. And I think we are incredible at reinventing ourselves and writing the next chapter of the American journey. And I have enormous confidence about our ability to do that. But this, and, and I say this, I write about this in the book about, I mean, my book, 
just so you have a sense of it, is the story of, it's an American journey. I'm the son of greatest generation parents. And I, my first memories, which I write about in the book, my, my mother was American, Boston family, you all know the history. But her father was doing business in Europe, and so she was born in Paris. And she had lived most of her life between England and France because that's where he was working, he was doing business. Uh, and when the war started, my mother's home was taken over by the Germans. They used it as a headquarters. She escaped on a bicycle in front of the German entry into Paris. She was working at the train station, Montparnasse, taking care of refugees. And she and her sister and a friend literally got on their bicycles and ran, you know, bipedaled across France to get out. She got on a ship in, 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 in uh, Portugal and, and made her way to Boston, where her sister was already living here. And um, so that's where I came from. I came from uh, memory at age four of holding my mother's hand and walking through the rubble of the home because she went back after the war. This is 1947. And I felt I could hear the glass crunching beneath my feet. My mother was crying. I didn't know why she was crying. And as a four-year-old, that bothered me. And, and there was a staircase going up into the sky and a chimney going up into the sky. That's all that was left of the house. After the war, my grandfather rebuilt the house around the chimney and around the stairwell. So you can still walk up them now. So I was introduced to war at a very young age. And then we found a mine in the middle of the driveway. There were German bunkers outside of the home that I played in as a kid. And it gave me a sense of, I, I saw the detris on the beaches of Normandy a couple of years later. And I've been back to Normandy many times because I find it just sacred land. It's an extraordinary place with an amazing story about, about values, about the willingness of people to put themselves on the line for things that are bigger than them. We've just heard a lot about that with George Bush's passing and with the eulogies of the last days. And it's something we have to get back to uh, in the country. So I, I uh, uh, then obviously, you know, came back from the war I served in, very angry about it, because we'd been lied to. I mean, we'd been lied to. And if you read the most brilliant book about Vietnam, Bright Shining Lie by Neil Sheehan, or read McNamara's memoir in which he acknowledges that they knew the war was not going to be winnable and was wrong, but they continued it. And he slipped off into public life uh, in the private sector in, 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 as a, in, you know, the head of the Ford Foundation, which rankled with a lot of us. And, and so we thought we needed to tell the truth. And I obviously paid a price for that, but I'm proud of it. I wouldn't have changed one thing in, in terms of you know, standing up to that. And our government right now is in serious trouble. Our country is in serious trouble. But I say that without leaving you sort of feeling, oh my God, you know, there's no way to fix it. There's every way to fix it, folks. I mean, we have the ability to change this. And, my, and the journey I write about in this book traces that. I think my book is a roadmap for how you actually deal with what we have to deal with now. And I'll give you an example. In 1970, after I'd come back, I came back in the spring of 69, and I was just decompressing and trying to figure out you know, how do you make a difference? How do you speak out about this war? And the first thing I did was actually in, in, engage in Earth Day, 1970. Some of you may remember, you, people didn't want to live next to the Woburn Waste site and get cancer. People didn't want to see the Cuyahoga River light on fire. People didn't want to see, uh, you know, cities where you couldn't see from one end of the city to another, Los Angeles, New York, and places. So. We brought 20 million people out of their homes on one single day. But we didn't stop there. What we did was translate that manifestation of discontent into making things that mattered voting issues. And so we targeted the 12 worst votes in the United States Congress. Some of you may remember this. We labeled them the dirty dozen, and in the next election, seven of the 12 lost their seats. What happened? 
immediately people, the survivors, Paul will tell you, there's nothing like watching your colleagues fall on one particular issue to stiffen your spine on that issue. And so that's what happened. They passed the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water, Marine Mammal Protection, Coastal Zone Management, and America got, for the first time ever, something called the Environmental Protection Agency. That's when it started. Richard Nixon signed that. Never proposed it, didn't ask for it, but he did it because it was a voting issue. So, fast forward to today. What happened in the last election, 20, in 2018? Well, we had the biggest turnout we've ever had in the midterm election. More than 100 million people, 113 to be precise. We elected the largest Congress, new Congress members since the Watergate, when we also manifested making things a voting issue. But here's the rub. That 113 million people represents only 49% of eligible voters in our country. When our current president was elected in uh, 2016, the turnout was 54.2%. Guess what? When Obama was elected in 2008, it was 62.3. When he was re-elected in 12, it was 58 point something. I forget, five or nine. And when I ran against George Bush in 04, it was 60.3%. You get the drift? So the story of where we are in America today is written, I think, more it's written partly by the people who voted, but it's written much more, folks, by our fellow citizens who were not motivated enough to exercise their rights as citizens and go out and actually rebuild America and do what we need to do. So what do we have to do? It's pretty clear to me. We're a democracy. We have the greatest freedom of any people on the planet. You don't get thrown into jail, at least right now, yet, for standing up in your soapbox and saying, or organizing people. And, and we haven't done that well. We just haven't. So we have to get back to doing that, and that's how I think we can turn the corner and restore this. And God knows there are enough issues to organize around. I mean, climate change, we are currently living out by omission and commission, a sort of mutually unagreed upon pact for suicide. Because that is literally the direction we're headed right now is four degrees increase centigrade this century. And every one of you read the headlines today that there's an increase in emissions over the course of the last year? That's completely unacceptable. When I negotiated the Paris Agreement on behalf of our country, it's privileged to do that. We agreed leaving Paris, we're gonna try to hold it to two degrees centigrade, and, and we'd all do our part. Well, last year, almost every single country didn't do their part. They went up in the number of emissions. It's getting worse, not better. Last year, you all spent $265 billion cleaning up after three storms. Harvey, which dumped as much water in five days in Houston as flows over Niagara Falls in an entire year. Irma, which had the first winds of a sustained 185, hour, 185 miles per hour for 24 hours and Maria, which devastated Puerto Rico. 265 billion, folks. And we can't even find 100 billion to fully fund the Green Climate Fund. So I wouldn't go on and on, but I'm, and I am, obviously. But I just tell you, I think there's an enormous amount for a younger generation to organize around, to get more excited. Only 31% of young people turned out. That is not sufficient to win back the future of our country. So we gotta go out and fight, no matter what. And you know, I began as an activist and I'm still talking to you as an activist. I think it's the only way to make things happen. When, when you came back from, uh, from Vietnam and, and wanted to speak out against uh, the policy of the war, you ended up essentially being on a, uh, one side of a divide in a larger cultural and political uh, that didn't have to be that way, but was created that way. Uh, you you uh, left the Navy, I believe, just a few months after Nixon's uh, speech, the, um, uh, the silent majority speech. And that seemed to, that divide 
did you believe that, do you understand that you were getting on the side of a divide that was going to last for decades and no i didn't uh, understand i knew i was getting on the side of a divide i mean uh, when i came back i mean remember folks i, I came back in 19 in, in 69 in the spring um as i said I, I i really didn't you know speak out for a little while um until I got a letter, frankly, that just kicked my gut from one of my closest friends. He's a lawyer down in Alabama now. He's a cotton farmer, too. Great, great guy. And he'd been with me on many of my missions and, and knows the truth of those missions and spoke out during the campaign. But um, this friend of ours, mutually, who was with me and when I won my Silver Star, as a matter of fact, was killed. And the letter and the description of the mission just kicked me in my ass as well as my gut and 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 prompted me to say i can't i can't do i cannot stay in uniform i have to get out i have to go do something to end the war that's when i asked the admiral i was working for for an early out from the military and he he was very very generous and very understanding and helped me get that and within months i was out and back in massachusetts and working to try to change things but i knew it was going to be tough um, remember, folks, one year and a bit before he left office, Richard Nixon was reelected by 49 states margin. He won 49 states. He was reelected, and um, uh, he attacked with the cultural divide, with the Southern strategy. He lied. He proved to be a crook, as did Spiro Agnew and Attorney General Mitchell and others. And the lies began to come out. The Pentagon Papers, other things began to sink in. And of course, 1968 was that year of tumult. I mean, the night I returned home from my first tour of duty in Vietnam off the coast of California, the first trickles of the radio that we picked up as we approached the coastline was the Ambassador Hotel. And Robert Kennedy's victory speech and then the shots. And the next morning we docked and that weekend was spent and just, you know, took me back to 1963 when I was playing in the Harvard Yale soccer game and a ripple went through the crowd and people said the president's been shot. And, and, and uh, within 20 minutes it turned into the president's died. I did not remember until I write the, wrote this book. I really did not remember until I researched it by going back to the Yale Daily News whether we finished the game or who won the game. I had no idea. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the refugee crisis in the world, displaced people, uh, the, the numbers have risen over the course of this decade, and we haven't even gotten to many of the worst effects of global warming that are going to affect that. Is that destined to be the issue of this half century, uh, displaced peoples? Well, I believe, well, it's part of climate change, but it's also part of other things. I mean, uh, let me, let me sort of take a moment to share with you my sense of, of, of where we are. I think it's important to have a feel for this. There's no mystery please, I say this respectfully, as to why we're where we are today in our country. Um, and I began to see it, and Teddy began to see it in the early 1990s. We began to feel the Senate changing. Maybe even a little before that, but, but definitively in the 90s, early 90s. And, it, 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 you know, there were times when I'd go over to Ted's house and, and we'd have dinner at night, and you know, Chris Dodd would be there, John, uh, 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 John Warner would be there, Mac Mathias from Maryland, um, uh, Orrin Hatch, and we'd laugh, and we'd talk to each other, and we'd, we'd, we'd dig into an issue, we'd, healthcare, whatever it was. And the next day, that, those relationships and that discussion could translate into action. And we'd get some things done. Not always. There were fights. But there was a fundamental basis of respect and civility which governed 
the Senate of those days, and I write about it in the book. And that began to change. It began to change with the Gingrich Revolution. And the Gingrich Revolution promised lower taxes, less government, less regulation. We're going to get rid of Roe v. Wade, blah, blah, blah. It did none of those things and failed on the subject of balancing and so forth, of, and certainly failed on ethics. Then you had the Tea Party sort of come along because the other had failed, and you had this constant moving right that was taking place with a more extreme, more orthodoxy ideologically, demanding the sort of caucus police, like a Ted Cruz today who promises to run somebody against somebody in their own caucus, comes out on the floor of the Senate and calls his majority leader a liar. This is what's been happening. And then the Freedom Caucus didn't deliver, so you wound up, uh, the, you, you know, you wound up with the, um, I mean, the Gingrich didn't make a difference, the Tea Party didn't make a difference, then the Freedom Caucus didn't make a difference, so guess what? You had a hostile takeover of the Republican Party by Donald Trump. And why? Because people are legitimately angry. And by the way, they're angry on the right, on the left, and in the center. And they have every reason to be angry. A lot of you probably are. Why? Because Washington is dysfunctional, folks, today. We don't pass budgets. They go down there on a Monday night, maybe Tuesday. They might have a bed check vote. They do a couple of things. Who knows? I mean, you know, and, and we see these disastrous hearings. And, and no comedy, no collegiality, no bipartisanship. And, and so nothing serious is happening. We need to rebuild America. Where's our infrastructure program? Can any person here name a major national infrastructure program? No, you can't, unless you consider the efforts to build this wall a legitimate effort. So, you know, you got Jerry Brown trying to do some, some uh, uh, high-speed rail out in California, that's state. You've got the Port Authority of New York rebuilding LaGuardia and talking about the future of New York, but that's not good enough for our country. I rode on a train in China that goes 300 kilometers an hour one half hour from Beijing to Tianjin on the coastline, and the water didn't even move on my table when the attendant put it, a glass of water on my table to drink. Now, I don't know how many of you have ridden the Acela lately. <laughs> it can only go 18 miles, only 18 miles of the trip between Washington and New York can it go over 150 miles an hour. You can't go fast under the Baltimore Tunnel because the vibrations may collapse the tunnel on you. You can't go fast over those rickety bridges of the Chesapeake because you may wind up in the Chesapeake. I mean, think about this, folks. We're the country that went to the moon. We're the country that, that uh, you know, invented the Internet. I mean, run the list of things we've done. We're not doing them today. We're not being asked to do them today. So I get burned up about this when I look at climate change, which is the single most serious uh, gargantuan challenge we have, which actually has a solution has a solution. You know what the solution is? Energy policy. All we have to do is make different choices about energy policy and we can fix this before it's too late, but nothing indicates that we are actually doing that. So I, I, I'm, you know, I got grandkids, I got kids, all of you do. I'm not content to just sit here. That's why I said I'm still an activist. Well, and I remember your fight to, to get that bill passed, uh, the energy bill in 2010. Uh, very frustrating. Um, I have a pet theory that the Senate would be uh, improved at least marginally if there were more CODELs, more bipartisan CODELs in particular. It could help uh, a bit, David. But do, you, you, do you have any? Uh, I'm just curious. You have, I know you have a John McCain uh, story. You, you know the principal thing, folks, in the Senate today? The rules have not changed appreciably. I mean, those of you who know the Senate know, it's not that the rules have changed so that everybody's frustrated because you can't do this or you can't do that. You can't do the things you want to do in the Senate today because of the people. It's not the rules that have changed, it's the people that change. It's an attitude that has changed. And if you're going to have thought police within a caucus who are willing to say to a colleague, we're going to run someone against you in a primary, and that person folds, because they just don't want a primary, then we do not have a Senate that's supposed to be what this great institution is. And, and I, you know, I think about that a lot because, it, and I talk, when I talk to other colleagues, former colleagues, one of whom I talked to today, 
we were just saying to ourselves, you know, how can this be that we have colleagues we know and like and respected who have suddenly become more interested in protecting personal power, president, and party than protecting the Constitution and the institution in which they serve. That's unacceptable. And you got to change it. So that's where we are. How do you change it? You got to go out and organize politically, folks. The only thing you can do. We got to have 70% of the people turn out. And I believe in the United States right now, there is a massive majority for doing things of common sense. There isn't one city in America where you don't have total gridlock. I think there was an article in the New York Times today or something about the hours that are lost trying to get to work, back to work, the lack of productivity, the emissions that are going up in from wasted. Uh, and this is part of the problem with why emissions have gone back up. So uh, we've got to get to common sense. Uh, what about uh, partners on the, on the world stage? Um, when you look at the Iran nuclear deal and Paris, who, are, who around the world are stepping up to try to keep things going, to try to maintain those big ideas and the big relationships while the United States seems to, have been, seem to be backing up? Well, this, is, this underscores the enormous opportunity cost of President Trump's decisions. There's enormous opportunity cost around the world you pull out of TPP, I mean, maybe the, there were things to fix in TPP. I can understand people who weren't happy with every aspect. So there were things to fix. But I think the world's greatest negotiator would have perhaps said to the people in it, hey guys, I don't like this deal. It was cut. I'm going to make a better deal because I'm a better negotiator. In fact, I'm the world's best negotiator. So I'm going to come in there and here are the five things I want fixed. I got news for you. They'd have been fixed. And you could have come back and shown how heroically you did it. But all he does, he doesn't negotiate. He pulls out. Pulls out of Paris, pulls out of Iran, pulls out of the TPP. Who are you kidding? I mean, the way to have got, I mean, if you're, we're all concerned about China. It's a legitimate thing to have concerns about market access, manipulation, taking, uh, forcing companies to turn over. I'm, I'm all for accountability there. But the best, you, you don't bludgeon people this way and expect to have them go to an off-ramp and do the diplomacy necessary to give in to you. And so we're on a terrible course with this sort of tit for tat. And now you see what happened in, in, in Argentina. You know, he comes out as usual and says, oh, we got all this stuff. Look at what we did. And of course, nobody can confirm it, including the people who negotiated on the other side of it. The Chinese. So we're left in limbo and the market reflects it. Boom, down 800, down 8. This is not the way to govern a great nation. Uh, and we are a great nation. And we need to get back to focusing on the things that make us so. But the partners are all trying to keep it. Hundred and almost 200 countries are going to be in Katowice, Poland. They are now and they will be there through this week. Negotiating sort of how do we take the conference of the parties to the next level of Paris. The problem is none of the things that are on the table, and I say this without being critical of my friends who are there, are going to get us close to where we need to be. Because when we negotiated Paris, we knew we were not leaving Paris with a guarantee that we would hold the Earth's rise of temperature to two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. We knew that. What we were banking on was 196 countries who signed the agreement were sending a message to the marketplace that all of us were going to move in the same direction at the same time, and that was going to make it possible for the allocation of capital to create the new widget, gadget, whatever it is that's going to get us through this mess. That's what we were banking on. And the first couple of years after Paris, we've only been three years, um, $358 billion was allocated to sustainable development and, and new energy, alternative energy, for the first time ever. For the first time ever, more money was put into alternative renewable energy than into fossil fuels. So we're moving in the right direction. The problem is we're not doing it fast enough, folks. And so what I'm proud of is that despite Donald Trump pulling out of Paris, 38 states in the United States have renewable portfolio laws. 
and the governors of those states remain committed to continue to try to implement Paris. More than a thousand mayors have committed to continue to try to implement Paris. So the 38 states represent 80% of the population of the United States of America. That's why I say to you I'm confident about the future, because while Donald Trump's pulled out, the American people clearly want to stay in and want to get the job done. In addition to that, um, the, on the Iran deal, a couple of months ago in September in New York, China, Russia, Germany, France, and Britain all met with the Iranian foreign minister. They are six other signatories to the Iran deal. It's not just the U.S. Seven countries signed it. The U.N. Security Council ratified it, 15 to nothing. And so those countries met and said, we're going to keep this deal going if we can. We're going to try and do everything we can. America can play a very disruptive role if it chooses to. But they're trying. So I'm proud of that. People say to me, aren't you feeling horrible that, you know, on a personal level? This is personal, folks. This is about all of us. And I feel good that people are trying to hang on to it. Nothing comes easily in politics. We've all learned that. But I believe that we can, if we make the right choices, it's not a matter of not having the capacity to solve the problem of climate change. It's a matter of not yet having the political will to do it. Is it even possible, though, to, to keep people's attention and energies focused on these? I'm thinking about Afghanistan, where we're actually fighting a war. There was just a, a UN conference, a peace conference. Uh, whether anything interesting came out of it or not, it sort of got no attention here. Uh, how is it possible that, that we can, as a people, influence our policy on something that we're not even paying attention to anymore? Well, this is the great danger of where we are in our great democracy today, folks. Um, we can't agree in America on baseline of facts. How do you govern a democracy in which you really cannot agree on what the facts are? Our colleague, Paul, and my colleague, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, had a wonderful saying, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And unfortunately, we're living in a world where people have actually suggested there's something called alternative facts. Well, there aren't, folks. Two and two is four, or four and four is eight. I mean, pick up a, pick up a, 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 a celestial almanac and read about where the moon is going to be five years from now, at what time and at what angle, and we know it. And it works every year. It's extraordinary what science actually tells us, Mr. President. <laughs> and regrettably, he, he doesn't believe in science. And maybe he doesn't believe in other things either. He seemed to have a hard time reciting the Nicene Creed yesterday. <laughs> uh, that's pretty... Maybe I gotta be <laughs> stay away from that. Uh, the point I'm making is this, my friends, and you are my friends. This is Massachusetts, and I'm <laughs> so privileged to have been able to represent uh, the state in, in the Senate for 28 years, and 26 of them to be with Ted Kennedy as my colleague, which was pretty remarkable. I should tell you some of the cloakroom stories, but they're in the book. <laughs> um, here's what I wanted to say. Nothing is, and it strikes me, I guess the further you get down the runway, the, you know, the more, John McCain and I used to talk about this, we were both pilots, he was a real pilot in the war, I was, I'm a civilian pilot. But um, we talk about how we were getting to a place in life where you have, you know, less runway in, in, in front of you and more runway behind you. And it makes you think about these things. Um, I visited with John down in Arizona before he passed away, and we talked about what we were able to do together bipartisanly on Vietnam, on POW, MIA, veterans, and so forth. Um, and it, was, it was a great relationship, difficult at times. We didn't agree on everything all the time. But the point was, John was able to forgive people who opposed the war. He was able to move to a place where some of his best friends were people who opposed the war. A great capacity for reaching across the aisle and forgiving, but that's not the norm. And 
with the loss of George H.W. Bush, we, we sort of sense that and feel that. Uh, it reinforces the importance of how you make our government work. But here's the point I want to make to all of you. We're an experiment. You've got to think about that. Read Federalist 85. Alexander Hamilton could not make it more clear how to govern, even back then when it was very filled with, you know, anger. And, and our founding fathers, who we revere, by the way, many of them hated each other. And they didn't get along, and they were tough relationships. Uh, and politics back then was tough. But they had a vision. When, when you know, you have to work at it. And, and they all knew that. And you have to shape it as you go on. But we are an experiment that is still being shaped, folks. And, and you can't be on automatic pilot the way we have been. It, it won't work. If you go back in history, the first, and I'm not going to go all through it, but the first millennium was pretty messy in terms of life and rights. I mean, you didn't have rights. Empires, dictators, emperors, a lot of killing, might makes right, live by the sword, die by the sword. And then you go into the next millennium, and, and it wasn't, you know, you have to get through the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and get on into the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and so forth before you began to have the rights of man and the French Revolution and John Locke and the thinking about how do we relate as human beings to our fellow human beings. How do we govern each other? How do we decide to organize our lives? That's what it's all about. And we came along and had a revolutionary notion about how you do that. And it's still revolutionary and worth the fight. But it only works when people are engaged and live out the greatest title there is. Not Mr. President, not Senator, but citizen. You got to be citizens. And if citizens can't agree on baseline facts of, you know, water, dirty, bad, get a disease, uh, you know, things that are pretty fundamental, then we've got a real, we got a real challenge ahead of us. And that's where we are today. And this, and here's what else has happened. Globalization, we have industrial revolution size change taking place but it's taking place at digital pace. That's never happened before. And so everything's moving faster. Goods and services move faster. Ideas move faster around the world. Lies move faster around the world. Remember what Mark Twain said, that, that a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth gets its boots on. Well, it double so today, and triple, 100,000 times so. And so, Everything's moving faster, my friends, and I say this after four years of being Secretary of State, sadly, except governance, almost everywhere. Too many failed states. Those people in that caravan that didn't represent a threat to us in our values or who we are or our nation, uh, which were exploited during the campaign, those people are trying to escape murder and rape and, and mayhem in their streets. And when, when we were in the Senate 10, 15 years ago, you know what we did when we faced the same thing? We put together Plan Columbia, a billion dollars, and we helped the nation to save itself with a courageous president named President Uribe. We don't have any such effort today helping those people develop a workable government, transparency, accountability, rights, rule of law, protection against marauding and murder. So we got to get back to these things, and I, um, I, I believe we can. I know that we were warned about this by a fellow by the name of, of you know, uh, Ben Franklin, who walked down the steps of Constitution Hall after they'd labored all summer putting together the new Constitution, and the night after they were successful and they finished, and he's walking down, a woman shouted at him. Uh, tell us, Dr. Franklin, what do we have? A monarchy or a republic? And he looked at her and he shouted back. He said, a republic, if you can keep it. That's where we are. Well, he was good up until he left Boston. But um, 
I think we're going now to, to uh, Q&A, and, and we wanted to uh, go uh, up. I, oh, there's a microphone up there. If, uh, oops, I'm losing mine. By the way, I called a, a number of your uh, former staff members, asked what I should ask. They, they wanted to know how great your staffers uh, have always been. <laughs> well, as Barbara Suliotis knows, every senator is only as good as their staff. <laughs> I've, it's I've, true, too. We got a, any questions from uh, upstairs? From the yeah. oh, here's a question here. The uh, the modest operandi of the Trump organization is to take over something that could be good: a hotel, uh, a casino, a father's real estate empire, and drive it to the ground and bring it to the brink of ruin, and then pull out, as you said, um, before it hits bankruptcy. So my question for you, Mr. Secretary, in 2020, when the American people pull out of the Trump presidency, can we count on you to clean up the mess? Well, I'm certainly going to do my part as a citizen. Uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, is, is that a 2020 question that's subtly <laughs> being put to me? Uh, I think I said very, very clearly, and I mean this, uh, I said a few months ago that I don't have any plans to run for office. I doubt I'll run for office again. I said that very clearly. Uh, I once responded to a question saying, uh, when somebody pressed at it, I said, well, you know, I haven't, uh, have I, uh, I said, I haven't taken it off the table, which is very, very different from actively working, pursuing, which I am not doing. Uh, and I mean that. I've been making phone calls and calling people and asking this and that. But occasionally it crosses your mind to sort of think about, you know, would you, won't you? I think we got a lot of good people around, personally. Uh, and um, we'll, see, we'll see. We'll see sort of where it goes. But I'm not doing anything to actively pursue that. I, I assume you'll be taking the, the well-trodden path of Massachusetts politicians and moving away to run for Senate in another state. <laughs> no, I am definitively 100% Sherman Eskley not doing that. <laughs> we have yeah. any other uh, uh, yeah. questions from upstairs? Thank you. Um, I have a question. You mentioned the history of the Senate. Uh, how do you feel about the confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh uh, from a traditional standpoint? Because it seemed like in the 80s and then with Clarence Thomas's confirmation, things had changed. Uh, what are your thoughts and feelings uh, on that overall? Well, I, I thought the hearings were very unfortunate. Uh, and um, I think... Uh, I mean, I don't want to rehash all of it, but I think, I think some serious mistakes were made on both sides. And I think it also evidenced a kind of lack of leadership input to try to set it up in a way that it didn't become a collision. But I, I, I don't think anybody would say that they were satisfied that uh, either party were treated the way they should have been, and then it came out the way it did. I also think that there was uh, something was missed at, at that moment when uh, he came out after the, after lunch and and um, uh, asserted as a judge a political conspiracy, mentioning people by names. I thought it opened up uh, an amazing line of inquiry, and I couldn't understand for the life of me why that was never pursued. Nor was I very happy that um, a certain senator's tirade against everybody on the other side was not addressed and answered, uh, which I think it should have been. So I, I came out of it, the whole thing, with a, just a real sense of dissatisfaction at the way you know, Ms. Ford was uh, treated, particularly in subsequent days, and, and particularly, I might add, by someone who has the least standing of all to be talking about those issues, who was vilifying her on the campaign trail, which I found disgraceful. So it's an ugly period of our, of our life right now. And um, 
we have to work very, very hard to kind of come together and get beyond that. We've got to end the vilifying somehow. We have to find a way to do it. I have been, I've, I've had a theory, you know, I said to you earlier about the people and the choices that you make. I was with George Mitchell the other day. We, we did an event down in New Haven. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's such a smart and capable, wise soul. And we were talking about the changes in, in the leadership and so forth. And he told me about how he'd walked into Bob Dole the first moment that he was elected the majority leader. And he sat down with Bob and he said, this is how I really want to see the Senate work. And the Senate he described was one where they respected each other. They didn't all agree. They were willing to give each other an opportunity to have voice, to work. And Dole looked at him and said, that's the best thing I've ever heard. Thank you for that. And they shook hands. And for the next years, the entire time they were there, there was never an angry word exchanged between the two of them, on the floor or otherwise. So it's people. It's how do you lead this thing and where do you go? And that's what we got to get back to. Do you have any other, do you have a question up here? Good evening, Mr. Secretary, and uh, thank you for your service. We'll never forget. Um, I wanted to just ask you if you could comment on um, the situation with the presumed assassination of the Washington Post reporter and um, the interesting dynamics that are going on in the Senate and in the House regarding that. Well, look, it's, um, <laughs> it's obviously, ex I mean, you know, you can find all kinds of adjectives to describe how, how disturbing or upsetting it is. Um, uh, the Saudis have acknowledged it was premeditated. The, they have said that this team went to, you know, and, and did what it did. And they have acknowledged that uh, uh, it was murder and that it took place inappropriately in, in every respect. Now, I have not been briefed on the who said what to whom and the phone calls and all this. I read what I read in the paper. I'm a former prosecutor. Uh, I, I sort of know what the, a pretty good sense of the standard of uh, you want to apply. I'd like to be briefed. Maybe at some point it's possible to be so for the rest of the Senate even to be briefed. I mean, let alone I'm an ex-senator, not sitting now. But clearly you have to find a way that you are not uh, putting an imprint of approval on impunity for such an action. And that's what the Senate's got to work out now, is what is that step? How do you make sure there's no impunity? Um, and it's very difficult. Uh, I, I think it is a difficult situation because there are important other things that are at stake in the relationship, in how it plays out, in what happens to the region. Uh, in how you bring the Yemen war to a close, in how you will deal with this fight with Qatar, in how you will deal with uh, Iran and, and, and sort of the regional security issues. Not to mention economics, which is always greatly tied up with the stuff that comes out of the ground there, out of the sand. So it's complicated and um, the important thing is that your values are represented in whatever you choose to do that somehow makes a statement about no impunity. Is, is, uh, and I want to go to questions down here too, but um, the, the administration criticized you, uh, said that you were getting involved, said that uh, former Secretary of State shouldn't get involved talking to, uh, is that true across the, the uh, former diplomats, uh, you know, are people just being shut out of uh, offering any input or, or having any... No, that's what I call a brushback pitch. Uh, you know, it happened on the very same day that Paul Manafort was announced to be talking to Bob Mueller. And as I said in my tweet in response to his tweet, and I rarely responded, he's attacked me a couple times. But what I said in the tweet was, you know, the conversation he really ought to be worried about is the one Paul Manafort had with Bob Mueller. Uh, so, if you want to go down that trail, I thought it was unprecedented for them to, you know, Henry Kissinger has spent 40 years traveling to China, traveling to Russia, traveling to Germany, going to conferences, talking with people, 
I met with the foreign minister in the context of a security conference in Munich called the Munich Security Conference, in the context of UN General Assembly Week when he met with the New York Times editorial board, Council on Foreign Relations, a whole group of senators, a whole bunch of people talked. And at that point in time, the president hadn't changed our policy. Our policy was still to be in the deal. So of course I was uh, happy to be uh, sort of informed because I think it actually helps to talk to people in other countries and be informed about the political choices you're making in diplomacy. Uh, they still have not even met with the Iranians. So, you know, I, I learned enough in f three years of negotiations. <laughs> you know, I was the first Secretary of State to sit down with my counterpart from Iran in 40 years. We sat down in New York in s September of 2013. The day I sat down with him, Iran had possessed 12,000 kilograms of enriched uranium, enough for 10 to 12 bombs. They had 27,000 centrifuges spinning in various facilities doing the enriching, 19,000 of them out there actually operating. They had uh, capacity to, to enrich up to 80, 90 percent, which is what you need to do to make a bomb. 80 or 90 percent. And they had a plutonium reactor they were about to bring online that could have made two plutonium weapons grade bombs worth of material a year. That's the day we sat down. Um, today, they have 5,000 of their oldest centrifuges that are allowed to spin. The others have been destroyed. The core of the plutonium reactor has been physically destroyed. They can never use it. They are limited to a 300 kilograms of stockpile, enriched only to 3.67 percent. You cannot physically make a bomb with that level of enrichment and number of amount of material. We have television cameras in their facilities. We put in 130 additional inspectors and we got them to sign up to what's called the additional protocol, which requires them to allow us to inspect any facility at any time if we have reason to believe they might be trying to do something nefarious and break out. No other country in the world is doing as much as Iran was required to do that is a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty, which Iran is. So all of that is working. And what does the president do? He pulls out. When he, when he, because he says, well, we don't like these other things they're doing. Well, we didn't either, folks. We sanctioned them for the missiles. We sanctioned them for the transfer of their weapons to Yemen. We sanctioned them for Hezbollah and for their threats and their involvement in Iraq. But what we also knew was you don't want to negotiate about a nuclear weapon and 20 other things so that you're trading off, or they're trying to trade off nuclear components against interests in these other things. We said, get the nuclear weapon in a box, get rid of it, take it off the table, and then you do a follow-on agreement on these other issues. Now, once again, I told you about TPP. If the greatest negotiator in the world were negotiating, he would say to our friends in Russia, China, Germany, France, Britain, who were friends part of this deal, I know they're, I'm not calling Russia and China, you know, beyond that, but they were, they were clearly cooperating in our efforts to rein in uh, Iran. And, and what you do is you go to them and say, hey guys, just like the other one, I don't like this deal. And by the way, I'm going to pull out of it in a year or maybe two, but while we got them contained, let's keep them contained. But I want you to guarantee me that if you don't, if we don't get it done within a year or two, you're going to be supportive of what we need to do to get them to behave. And you get their support to do a follow-on agreement. That makes much more sense while you keep the agreement in place rather than tear it apart. You know what has happened, folks? I guarantee you, go Google this, go talk about anybody about Iran. It's empowered the hardliners in Iran who are now empowered because President Rouhani is embarrassed by the outcome because they told him, you can't negotiate with the great Satan, you can't negotiate with America, they're going to burn you, don't do it. And these are people who wanted a nuclear program in Iran. Now, they're saying, we told you so. 
And no Iranian leader could possibly just crawl back to the table now, folks. It, it, it's sort of the same problem we have in the way we're trying to approach China. China, you have to deal with. Iran, you have to deal with. But try to have a few people around you. Even a powerful country like the United States of America needs friends. And we need them at the table when we negotiate. And by the way, when you, when you read the book, there's, it, 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 these negotiations do not get too bogged down in the technical nuclear. There's actually much more about Wiener Schnitzel in, in, in the book that I, <laughs> that I, that I had expected in the negotiations. Yeah. Do, do we have a, a question there, down here? Oh. <laughs> Who is your favorite president and why? You know, I never answer, I never say one president only, because I don't have just one president only. I really don't. Uh, I have enormous, uh, I think everybody does. I mean, how can you not say that Abraham Lincoln isn't one of the most extraordinary people in the world? Because he saved the Union. And he did it under such amazingly hard circumstances and, and really provided just enormous leadership. Uh, obviously, uh, I think Roosevelt uh, was just an extraordinary president as well. Uh, president Kennedy has left one of the most remarkable uh, legacies of, of, of inspiration and hope, as well as the nuclear uh, test ban, the focus on, on nonproliferation, his American University speech, groundbreaking efforts to reach out and change the world with respect to diminishing the capacity for war, brought us into the new generation, if you will. I will give credit to Reagan. I think Reagan was a, was a leader. And Reagan uh, had the courage to go to Reykjavik, meet with Gorbachev, and actually stop us from being in two nations that had 55,000 nuclear weapons focused at each other. 50,000. That's where we were. Now we have 1,500 and some. And we're trying to take that down to less. That's the right direction to move. And such eminent people as Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, uh, William Perry, uh, uh, a whole bunch of former secretaries of defense uh, have all come out and said, you know, the goal ought to be ultimately to have a world without nuclear weapons. Now, it takes a long time to work through conflict resolution and how you deal with conventional weapons and deterrence, and a lot of things have to be worked out. But every step you take towards doing that, if you think about it, actually makes the world safer. So uh, I think they've been, uh, obviously, our, our greatest presidents. Uh, and I uh, probably left somebody out, but it was not Warren G. Harding, and it's not the current guy. <laughs> if, can I get one more uh, question down here? Yep. Uh, he's bringing the microphone here. Uh, so my question is... Can I just interrupt you for one minute? Yes, I'm sorry. Washington's greatness for saying no at a time, you know, setting the concept of, of one term or leaving, not being there forever, is remarkably important to the fabric of our country. And, and his leadership through those early years is, is quite stunning. What do you say to someone in my generation, specifically the millennial generation, and there are quite a few of them here today, who want to be engaged in public service, who want to be part of the political fabric, be involved, all the things that you mentioned, but are burdened by student debt? And there's quite a few of us uh, who are, and we're always worried about where our next paycheck's gonna come from, whether we can pay down the debt, and it is a pretty hefty student debt. I think it's in the trillions of dollars range. Thank you. Well, we have to, we have to reduce that burden. We cannot, which is one of the things we started to do. Senator Kennedy worked very hard with others to create the, you know, the debt reduction program. So we created uh, the teach, yeah, what's, uh, AmeriCorps. And you go teach and you pay down debt. And there are ways to give something back to your country and reduce the debt at the same time. I'm for growing that significantly. I personally believe, always have, every person ought to serve their country somehow. There ought to be a national service. It doesn't require you. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to go into the military, not at all. 
but you know, there's, I mean, I started a program, and I didn't start the program, I took the program to Washington. I was introduced to it in New York City, I write about it in the book called Youth Build. And I was introduced to it by Dorothy Stoneman, a fabulous lady here in Massachusetts, who, who, who started this program. And it takes young kids uh, out of a court diversion program, out of a, uh, out of, uh, you know, a track for jail or off the street, and they come into the program and labor donates their skills and teaches these kids how to recapture a brownstone building in New York. It began in New York. I first saw it in 1992 at the convention when I was in New York and I promised these people I'd go up and look at the program. I met 15 kids, one of whom said to me, Senator, nobody has ever said to me the words, I love you, not in my life. And he proceeded to describe his life in the streets. And he'd come into that program, became a leader in it, actually. And I was so impressed by what they were getting their high school equivalency. They were gaining citizenship, not by themselves, but because the program was there, not because a whole bunch of politicians came together and helped make it happen. So I, I, I went, I was then a very young senator, still 92, uh, just in my second term, and I, was chair of a housing subcommittee and I did what chairman can do. I got it written into the bill and we funded it and then we refunded it and then we grew it. Now it's in states all across our country. Tens of thousands of kids have been through it. They've gone on to college, they've gotten married, they've got families and they came out of a track for prison, out of a track for drugs, out of addiction, out of crime. And you know, that's the kind of thing young people could go help do or work in a hospital, or work in a senior center, or help with a growing older generation where you need caretakers for more things. There's something for everybody to do. And um, I, I, I would love it if we could reduce or eliminate student debt by supporting that kind of a program where you're really getting something back for, you know, you're not just wiping it out, you're not saying it's easy road and automatic, you don't owe something. So I think the ethic of Working that way and of, of contributing is a really good one for our nation. It would get everybody more of a stake in it. I, I know the volunteer army has worked in terms of where we are and you know the, our capacity to defend ourselves, but it doesn't work in the sense that it requires every American to have a stake in defending our nation. That was one of the great problems that motivated a lot of us in my generation to fight back against the Vietnam War, the way the draft was being implemented. And, and, you know, if you had money, connection, capacity to go to school, you could get married uh, and then get unmarried, but got your deferment by getting married, or got your deferment by, uh, you know, having somebody to let you go to endless grad schools, et cetera, or find a doctor who could write a really good letter for you because you had bone spurs and five <laughs> guns, you know. Then you got out. I don't think that's right. And I don't think it helps our country. Well, we have to uh, wrap up because uh, the uh, secretary has to jet around the world to other engagements, uh, literally. Um, so, well, I'll tell you uh, what I'm doing. That sounds too... Uh, <laughs> That sounds much too much fun. Uh, I'm actually, I'm going to India uh, tonight, but I'm going to be doing something there with a new solar company that's trying to put a rooftop solar out. And, and, you know, we've got to do everything we can in every part of the world to grow the capacity to reduce the emissions. So it's got a purpose, I, actually. I, I was not attempting I'm to insinuate it. I'm otherwise. sensitive to it, you know. Um, I know what happens. Somebody out there is going to tweet, <laughs> you know. And then I'm in trouble. But do you have uh, any final thoughts, any encouraging signs that you're seeing? Yeah, uh, can I say to everybody, I, I hope you will, because I haven't said enough about this in the context. I keep saying to you, I'm confident, I'm optimistic. I, believe, I really am. Let me tell you why. Because if you look at that inexorable march that I talked about earlier, think about it. We're doing better, even though things are horrible right now, the way our government is or isn't doing things, even though our country feels off kilter and is in, in, in many ways. Nevertheless, 
we're living longer than we've ever lived as people. Humans are. Most people in many parts of the world are now living better. There's still a billion people without electricity. But if you are a woman somewhere in the world today and you're pregnant, you're 50% more likely to live through pregnancy, to live through childbirth. And your child is 50% more likely to live through it and to go to school and have food. If you look at disease, we're curing diseases. We never thought we'd cure. We're curing smallpox, malaria, TB, uh, many cancers. The genome has opened up an unbelievable opportunity to raise the quality of life and standards of living. We, 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 we look at what we did with Europe at the end of World War II, and, and I wish Europeans would have a better sense of this right now. But, you know, we rebuilt Germany. We, President George Walker Bush helped us reunify Germany. We built a strong Europe. The Europeans have had the greatest rise of income and quality of life of any people on the planet. If you look at people being killed violently, far, far fewer people dying violently today, notwithstanding what we see in Yemen or what we see in Syria, far fewer people dying than, it, than in the last century. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, unbelievable violence. 450 million people have been brought out of poverty in China. 400 million or so in India. When I was at college, and that means some of you here, the severe poverty level in the world was 50%. Today it's below 10% for the first time in human history. We're on the brink of seeing the first generation of children born AIDS-free in Africa because of PEPFAR, American Initiative Effort in Africa to Change Life. We're, you know, we're, we're, we stopped Ebola. I remember sitting in the White House being briefed in September when we were being told a million people are going to die in the next four months if you don't do something, if there isn't something that's done. We did not know what we didn't know. But President Obama had the courage to send 4,000 troops over to West Africa. We worked with the British and the French. Each took a country. And guess what? We stopped Ebola in its tracks by Christmas. And a fraction of those people died. So I can go around the world. I can, I mean, you know, fundamentally, folks, uh, the world is in many ways, even as we see this populist uh, uprising and this dangerous authoritarian exploitation taking hold, and it's dangerous. John Shaddock's here. He ran the university in Budapest that we're just reading about now, having to move out. Dangerous stuff happening. People have been emboldened in places we don't want them emboldened. President Xi and President Putin are very busy promoting a new uh, narrative. You can, it's very overt. And that narrative is that the liberal order of the West is in decline, it's over, and the United States of America is in decline. So we need to show people that's not true. And we will show it by the things we choose to do, not by words. So I, I hope everybody, you know, there isn't one problem on earth with the exception, as I write about it a little bit in the book, as I talk about faith and other things. I mean, one of the great struggles in faith is that it's very hard to explain war, number one, and terrible things people do to each other. And it's very hard to explain where God's plan is in an earthquake or a tsunami or something. And this is an old debate. You can go back to, you know, way back to Rousseau and, uh, and, and it's a fascinating debate. But the uh, bottom line is that, um, that other than tsunamis, earthquakes, um, and, and uh, floods and those things that are God-given or natural disaster, however you want to frame it. Every problem we have is human created. All the others are. Have you ever met a child, two and a half years old, who hates anybody? Hates the broccoli, maybe, hates the babysitter, doesn't want to go to bed, but no, come on. People don't hate people at first. They're taught to hate. Hate's taught. And right now, we have too many bigots and too many demagogues and too many uh, people in power who are preaching hate and dividing people. 
and, and taking the world in the wrong direction. Remember what the 1930s and 20s were like, folks. You know, fascism and communism came because of partially the failure at that period of time the, the, with the depression of capitalism to prove itself. And so we fought a war, world war. And there are, there are dangerous signs of, of migration, of conflict over people, over who people are, what they believe. You're not me. You're not us. You're not like us. And we're the one experiment on this planet that defines people as American, not by a bloodline, not by a tribe, not by a race, but by an idea that all people are created equal. So my, I believe that we're, Americans are still excited by that. I really do. And I think if we do our part to sort of stay excited about it, we can win on all these people-created issues. We can build the bridges. We can build the power plant that works, that's clean. We can do these things. We absolutely can. But you can't do it if only 49% of the people are choosing to get involved. You can't do it if people shy away and say, not me, I'll leave that to somebody else, I'm too busy. And, and I'll close on, on this. The, the, the great issues where we, we didn't fix everything, there were excesses, and, and anybody of my generation will plead guilty to some of the excesses, but guess what? We were deeply engaged. We marched. When I was at college, we sent buses down to Mississippi to register people to vote to break the back of Jim Crow. We, we, we were engaged in the Civil Rights Movement. You go down to the Southern Poverty Law Center in Alabama and you'll see the names of the people who were hung and murdered just trying to vote in our country back in the 1960s. We had a president who had an enemies list. He vilified the FBI. He lied to the nation. There was slush money. There were pipe bombs going off in America. There were people with machine guns running around and kidnapping people. And we had fires in cities as they were rioting. Come on. And we got through it because the institutions of our country are fundamentally strong, but it really took a young generation going out there and doing those things. The peanut butter and jelly brigade of students up in New Hampshire who helped Gene McCarthy say to Lyndon Johnson, you can't run again. And same thing for the women's movement, same thing for the environment movement, same thing for all these things. You've got to make things voting issues. That's how we win back the United States of America, period. Well, I want to thank uh, John Kerry, uh, the Secretary, and the Institute, and, and Vicki, and, and Mary, of course, uh, for inviting me to be part of it. And if everyone can exit through those doors on both top and bottom, uh, there will be book signing. And like I said, he's got limited time. So if everyone could uh, go out and thank you all very much.